Welcome to the Nook on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm Steve. I'm here today with Mike. Yo. Matt. Hey. And John. Cheers. And uh, Mike, mm. we're going to have Mike's Beer Corner today. What do you got for us, I Mike? I got the Beer Corner today. No way. Sweet. Um, it is, uh, the brewery is Shipyard uh, Brewery out of Portland, Oregon. And this is their barley wine and uh it's pretty damn smooth a little on the pricey side really? but very much worth it barley wine is usually uh you can really taste the alcohol in it more, more than anything else but this tastes like a really strong guinness so it's in my book pretty damn amazing so it's thick mm-hmm. yeah cool. nice. awesome. who's by again uh shipyard brewing company in nice. portland oregon yeah I don't think I've had their barley wine before. Yeah, it's worth it. If you see it floating around somewhere. Shipyard, right? Uh, <laughs> I made a funny enough. But really. um, <laughs> and since this is a brewed beverage, I'll plug it because I've mentioned Kavita before. Uh, their master brew is really good. This is a uh, grapefruit. They're both their grapefruit and their ginger is really good stuff. Ginger seems to go good with kombucha, I think. Yeah. Mm, very good with kombucha, for sure. Uh, so today, I wanted to talk about a subject I think is often op- overlooked in the libertarian community, mm-hmm. and that is the subject of the environment. Mm-hmm. I think I think part of the problem is that often the anarchist libertarian circles uh, tend to do one of two things when it comes to the environment. Uh, pretend like it doesn't exist as a problem, mm-hmm. or rigorously attack anything environmental as something uh, as a statist. Right. And I'm not saying that all their charges are wrong. Mm-hmm. Like for instance, with global warming. Right. You know, I honestly don't know what what's going on there. I think I think there probably is climate change. The uh, climate does change. It's part of, I, you know, a planet, I doubt yeah. I doubt humans have as much of an impact as they're claimed to be, but I think also that it's impossible to tell with all the problems that have gone gone on with the studies and stuff. I think it came out fairly recently that a lot of data was fudged or hidden there, on there, the subject. There's been data or that's... Or embellished on the, toward the, the, right. the doom there's persuasion. Been, there's been data that's been fudged and then... Uh, you know, I, I can't remember the name of the article, but it really made me laugh when I saw it was that... You know, it, I don't think it was Al Gore's movie, but it was, uh, you know, somebody had made a, a documentary somewhere. It may have been Al Gore's movie, but um, that the ice caps were supposed to melt by 2018. Like, they're not <laughs> supposed to be there, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we've got about three years. Do you really think they're going to be completely gone in three years? Well, so if they're there, and they're probably not going to be as small as they said they're supposed to be because... Uh, you know, uh, officially there is a stall or a or a slowing down of climate change. I mean, that is from the, you know all these scientists involved in the you know UN. Uh, well, part of the problem well, too yeah. is that they say that there's a consensus, mm-hmm. right? But consensus even science. among those that the group inside this consensus, mm-hmm. there are something like eighteen different models that they mm-hmm. that they use to predict the well, right so if there's a consensus why isn't there one or two major models why why 18 different ones yeah uh, all, all highly uh, with with uh, with credible backing this is one that always sticks in the back of my mind but it doesn't sound like something that's been yeah, you know, Solved. if, there, you know if there's mean? so many different opinions on it, why, you know, why isn't it more uniform? But the one thing that, that sticks into my mind is um, 
because there's, there's uh, this climate stuff, I, and I don't mean to say that, like, I don't mean to say that, like, haphazardly, it's like climate stuff, you know, whatever, blah, 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 but um, uh, the damage that we are doing to the environment is real, but the outcome of what these different scientists or, or groups are saying has been changing, and so that should put doubt in your mind, because I remember when I was, you know, a uh, smaller version of myself watching uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy used to do a show, uh, a science show, where he would narrate the whole thing. And I remember was the one that he was doing on the environment. He was saying that, well, in the future, scientists are predicting global cooling. The world's going to be colder. Not hotter, but colder. So think about that. So what happened in the, in the, in the span of, you know, I mean, was to be the exact opposite. You know, that's it, what kind of makes me like a mini little... ice age. And... Yeah. yeah. I had recently read the ocean is a larger heat sink than they thought. It can right. absorb more energy than they believed in mm-hmm. the past. So I think there are a See, lot of... See, I was just reading recently that that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge contributes a lot more to the, the temperature of the climate than they previously had predicted. That's my, that's my experience, right? So I... I consider myself someone who's environmentally sensitive. I, uh, right. uh, have the heart of a greenie, you know what I mean? Love the trees and all that stuff. But I go in and, and, and start doing my own investigation on, you know, global warming. Is it anthropogenic or not? And and you find that, um, yeah, the, there's you can find a study to say whatever you want, right? And so if you're not... If you don't have the scientific foundation to go and start picking these apart or not, then you're left at the mercy of whatever they say. So then I fall back more or less uh, on who, key bono, you know, who 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 benefits, yeah, right. right? So the the IPCC intergovernmental panel Thank you. That on was the name yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, intergovernmental right. panel on climate change. That's a wholly a, a, a UN apparatus, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so, personally, I'm jaundiced with anything that even remotely has any affiliation whatsoever with the United Nations. Yeah. From the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal De- Human Rights, you get down to Article Number 27 or 28, whatever it is, and you find out it's pretty fucking dark, you know. And uh, you know, the, the, and, and, the, and the reason for that being is is because, like you know, from what you've looked into, the the UN seems to have uh, alternative, or rather, uh, uh, it's kind of somewhat shadowy motives for what they do, yeah. rather than just saying that they're for world peace, which right. is what we would like to believe that they're there for. Is they like, may you know, be able or, to yeah. achieve that through uh, global <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. slavery. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There will be world peace <laughs> if it's all under one dominion, right? right. You know, so, yeah. so goes the, the, the Roman philosophy. Me and Steve were talking about this earlier about, you know, the Roman Empire and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the confidence of we have control over everything sort of mindset. Yeah. And I, I think that that is to be, uh, that is to be mentioned too when it comes to the environment is that um, it, it's there's a there's a certain point of, of hubris that comes up when yeah. talking about the environment, and that they, they, you know uh, you know we, we think that we know what's going on in the environment, we know we can pinpoint everything that's going on, and this is how it affects the environment. There's no way. I mean, like, even so with, with like, the, the sort, of, sort of computers we have nowadays, there's no way you can say exactly what's going to happen to the environment depending on who does what and all this sort of stuff. And so I, I don't want to, you know, change the topic and have the whole thing be about chemtrails, but I think that should be brought up. Right, that's that, not present that, in any of the models, right? Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> you know, they believe that they can manipulate the weather to their desire and you know you can you know i'm not going to sit there and be like well that's a chemtrail that's a contrail you know let's not get into that argument because really it's night right now right but um uh you know they um uh they've admitted that that's something they want to do you know there is you mentioned it there's a there's a report you know uh uh, 60s you you know controlling the weather by 20 well yeah there's the national science foundation 
uh, I don't know exactly how that relationship worked, but basically there was a congressional committee on weather modification, a committee formed in 63, I think it is, mm -hmm. and in their report published in 66 as the National Science Foundation letter 66-3, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lengthy report on, on weather modification. And then you can look at the U.S. Treaty on, uh, on uh, weather manipulation with Canada and uh, mm -hmm. Mexico. That's 1977 or something like that, 73 or 77, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. But these are things you can actually look up and say, okay, they've been having this conversation for a long mm -hmm. time. And then, yes, uh, there's the U.S. Air Force uh, I think it's a position paper or something like that. Uh, it's got uh, several Air Force officers who authored it, and, and its title is Owning the Weather 2025. Yeah, that's okay, yeah. Right, so how can they submit uh, this idea or, or, or uh, forward this idea of owning the weather without experiments? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, exactly. It, are we just visually? Yeah. You know, we will. Is what we witness the experiments? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So, it, it, to me, it, and Zbigniew Zabrinsky, <clears throat> in Between Two Ages, nineteen seventy, I think it is. He, he speaks about uh, manipulating the weather to influence the opinions of the general public. Mm -hmm. Zbigniew Zabrinsky went on to be national security advisor for Jimmy Carter. Is the current advisor mm -hmm. to I mean, Obama, yeah, right? So, even back uh, to Tesla, Tesla was inducing lightning and, uh, I, from my understanding, even artificial aurora out in Colorado. Right. Yeah, 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 with the people walking along and seeing, like, you know, you lightning power, bolts connecting to their... Yeah. Um, Blew up a power station, yeah. Yeah, people were pretty pissed off about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm suspect with it. It, it. And even, like, <clears throat> so I go to the point of, like, you've got... The Koch brothers, and there's an article out there about the Koch brothers funding uh, a study that debunks anthropogenic global warming. Mm -hmm. but, Keep in mind the Koch brothers are a little eh, well, I, I, shady I, origin. Well, that actually, I almost look at it as, uh, and I, I haven't done enough to, mm -hmm. to right. say absolutely, but to me, I, I feel like this is the dialectic. Right? Mm -hmm. You right, got, right. You okay. Got, yeah. You got There's ultimate, one and the other. Ultimately, yeah. it goes back goes back to one primary source, Rothschild ish, something like <laughs> that. <right? laughs> There's somebody who's getting interest on and, ones and zeros, and you've got yeah. factions that ultimately are born of that, that are generating studies that contradict each other, mm -hmm. and it ultimately serves the purpose of getting the people divided. Mm -hmm. So that's a benefit for them. Mm. Carbon credits. That's another and thing. And ultimately, huge, yeah, trying to, to afford a system. Another that, system of control. Right. It ties into glo Agenda 21. Mm. And uh, as a big Nizhabrinsky said, the, te the, the technocracy of basically a scientific dictatorship. It has right? a lot to do with uh, seizing more assets like oil and, you know, oh, you guys are using too much. I mean, it's just all about control. Well, right? oh, yeah, exactly. I think, I think there are some, there are legitimate ecological concerns Concur. in a lot of cases for instance like fracking yeah for sinkholes uh, and pollution in ohio right uh, huh sinkholes yeah. in I well I'm, like like fracking people's water being lit on yeah <laughs> natural <laughs> gas <laughs> Not burning, burning water <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely no but um and but when you trace back a lot of these problems it all goes back to government as a matter of fact government is the world's largest polluter Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yet government intervention is always touted as the way to stop uh, environmental look at, disasters look and at all the nuclear thing. waste that governments have created yeah. and they don't know what to do with yeah. or corporations the limited li liability aspect they're allowed right, to, exactly. to, to fracking do. is as a result of government getting involved would 5,000? yeah exactly yeah. Um, would 5,000 feet Oil, you know, d drilling for oil in five thousand feet of water before you start drilling, would that even be economically viable without uh, subsidies state, yeah, and yeah. and limited liability? Yeah, right, with, right. with with the Gulf oil thing, like they're you know, it was they'd rather drill closer, but because they want tourists to come to the beach, they're like, we'll give you money, just go farther out. Hey, yeah, we can do that, but it's really far down and kind of dangerous. Ah, don't worry 
about it. You got a cap on how much you're liable for. I remember <laughs> when that was going on, when the Gulf oil spill was going on, listening to, listening to NPR of all um, radio stations. And I'll never forget it because it was pushing a 10-second clip. Pushing 10 seconds. Where, it's, where while this was going on, while you know everybody remembers the video of the oil just spewing out of that busted pipe, while all that is going on, the Senate voted again to renew the $2 million cap for how much you know an oil company is liable for in a spill. And I remember we're like, like I remember hearing that being like, what? <laughs> like, why are people pissed at this? I was getting ready to go to work in the morning, and I never heard of that again yeah. at all. Of but like, not. yeah, ten second clip, dr- leaving for work in the morning on NPR. What? They just renewed the cap while like shit spewing out. The, the fact golf. that you heard it at all was probably a slip up. Yeah, right. <laughs> They're like, oh, that didn't get past the censor. There's that whole. You can look at BP as well mm-hmm. with, that, with that whole flow thing. And I think you were capped at it was number like, like thirty billion or mm-hmm. something. It was something but yeah. BP obviously fought on to you know lived on to fight another day but uh, I think something other people often pass up when discussing this too is the fact that property rights work extremely well in curbing reckless uh, reckless uh, polluting and, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing yeah exactly because if your plant is polluting mm-hmm. my land, mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're liable for that, right? But and not if the government says you're not. And let's look at, uh, maybe because we were already talking about it, it was what's keen in my brain, but so the, the, the oil spill, right, you know, in the Gulf. So let's think about if they're, you know, held liable for all the damage that they did to every single, you know, uh, shrimp fisherman, every single, you know, property owner on the beach. Maybe there was a private beach, you know, I, you know, it's endless how much damage was really done. What if it would, you know, if the accountant had run the numbers, would have been into their advantage to drill all the way out there? Probably not. Probably not. No, the only reason they did it is because they knew they were getting covered. But it's the same thing you with know, like yeah. nuclear power, right? Uh-huh. So the, the, yeah. the potential yeah. for nuclear to go bad is beyond anyone's ability to pay for it. Oh, yeah. Right? So they, they operate from the get-go on the premise that uh, in a worst-case scenario, they're not going to be fully held fully responsible for their damage. Right. right. And to me, that's a, a beautiful example of why, whether it be corporate or whether it be state or some kind of pseudo uh, utility, public utility type situation, the the, uh, the the chances, the opportunities to for corruption to take hold are too great, to, and the risks too high to to go down that road. Yeah. And then you look at let's look at conservation too. Look how poorly government solutions have done in the conservation of animals. I was, it was probably only a month or two that I read about some, the, the last of the northern white rhinos or something like that was, was poached. Mm-hmm. And prior to that happening, they have pictures of this rhino being guarded like round the clock mm-hmm. by, by government. Yeah. And the the poachers are still managed to get by. Mm-hmm. Yet in areas where they monetized the the herds, mm-hmm. in other words, they said, "Okay, these are your herds. You take care of them, and you can make money off of them. They're, they're your herds." Mm-hmm. The numbers went up in every in every case that I read of. Um. A because oh, because it only makes sense if this is your if all of a sudden you're benefiting from keeping these animals alive mm-hmm. all of a sudden it's going to be a lot more important to you to keep these animals alive yeah. you know what I mean um, a kind of older example but it still applies is um, is uh, the the American bison buffalo yeah, yeah bison, buffalo yeah, yeah. Um, you. I, 
they're still they're not endangered species anymore officially. They're they're protected is, is what they call it. But they bison aren't protected. They I they have bison burgers in the well. That's the, the thing. They're protected. Store. They're not endangered. When they're endangered, you can't do a damn thing with it. But when they're protected, it's it's. That's there's a different line or something. Maybe they're not even protected anymore. But I've had a buffalo burger too. Not gonna lie, it's pretty damn tender. We will do a future episode on animal rights. There's um, one of the things on, on uh, buffalo too. Uh-huh. There are no purebred American buffalo bison anymore. Right. They're all, er, all every herd, every buffalo, every every American bison that you see mm-hmm. is so is ac- is actually part bison part cow Mm -hmm. they thought for a long time that the herd on catalina island was pure but dna tests proved that it wasn't pure and how far would you really have to go back to to prove the dna that there was no mix at all you know because at at a certain point you know well how long a cow has been in north america pretty damn long time at this point so but Probably about 500 years. Yeah, something like that. But, um... You know, it's... So, you know, what a lot of in the... In, uh, you know, your 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 mainstream media, if you will, what's, what's touted is there's a lot of green technologies that are being put forth. Like, well, Where? you know, we need green technologies. Where? You said mainstream media. Mainstream media. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that, um... You know, there, there, there are certain solutions that are put apart now. I want to preface this with the fact that I think continuing the idea of using fossil fuels for a source of, you know, your, your mainstay for where you get your, your power for any sort of, you know, internal combustion engine is a horrible idea. That's not going to work anymore. It's impossible. It can't be done. But uh, a lot of these green technologies are not so green. Um, you've got... Um, you know, uh, for a lot of cell phones, they need what are called rare earth elements. You know, I mean, these are things on the periodic table which are just barely ever seen. But when they find a, a location that has some of them, they get they, invaded. They dig. <laughs> yeah, they get invaded. Yeah, <laughs> Afghanistan, right? They found a whole bunch of lithium. But um, which is another story for why they may have invaded Afghanistan. There are about 20 of them, so <laughs> that's an episode in itself. Why was there an invasion of Afghanistan? That, oh. was, that was written up prior to 9-11, too. I wouldn't be surprised. But so there is a. Uh, Don't so be crazy, Mike. We invaded Afghanistan because of 9 11. Ter- uh, terrorism, man. Terrorism. America. <laughs> yeah, invaded Afghanistan because America. a bunch of Saudis flew planes into yeah. buildings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a Marine Colonel. The Egyptians. Who, who, uh, there's I'm a sure. Marine Colonel who said they, uh, they were defending poppy fields there. Yeah, oh no. Yeah, yeah, I got remember, pictures of that. <clears throat> no, I remember watching the news when, when I was in uh, high pictures school. of soldiers walking through poppy fields. Yeah, I remember watching the news in high school and watching them, like, you know, coming up with a reason for why they're protecting poppy fields. They're like, oh, well, you know, this is the only source of income they have. It's like, wait, you just invaded Afghanistan and you're guarding poppy fields? Okay, cool, whatever. But, uh, you know, so when they find us, you know, a small amount of these, like, rare earth minerals, it's like dig, 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 and they just fucking, I mean, talk about, you know, mining operation and no regard whatsoever of, like, the consequences of it. Mm-hmm. When it comes to finding rare earth minerals, they just go, shit, we can pay this shit off from what we get out of here. Just fucking dig. Yeah. And so Dude. it gets pretty wild. Dude, have you ever heard of, of strip mining? Yeah. That's where they to- cut the top of a mountain off Yeah. to get to the stuff easier. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the uh, earliest examples of, you know, pollution. And all those toxins and, and stuff? Straight downstream. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, well, why do they care? It doesn't matter. The government will cover their ass. Exactly. You know, you, if, you know, if they're not going to cover them directly through legislation, they know they got a buddy who they can talk to who's going to, you know, come up with a way to make sure they're not liable for it. So I guess the way it would be different in a voluntary society would be people wouldn't be allowing to govern the government to do these things. Like, what like, government? Exactly. <laughs> it, nobody would making it, it, if somebody was doing this, you would address them as you know, if it was a person or a group of individuals. But but the the problem now, like a lot of issues, is pe- the government gets a pass on all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the risk assessment would be a natural uh, stopgap, a natural yeah. uh, 
barrier to doing things that are economically untenable otherwise, right? When you have your, you know, uh, liability removed. And I see that, uh, yeah, volunteer society is also much, I think, not consumer driven, right? So you have the economies of scale, these big, these big corporate model or economies of scale to work in, and you got all kinds of forces that are incentivizing consumption and spending. I think in a cons in a volunteer society, it's naturally probably more becomes more save, mm -hmm. you know, save your money, less consumer driven, mm -hmm. and more local. So uh, economies of scale is where you know it gets bigger, bigger, bigger. That model goes away. <clears throat> and since everything's kind of local, probably people are a lot more concerned about how resources are used, about the stewardship, mm -hmm. and how how uh, companies and, and institutions, if you will, how they practice uh, stewardship. Uh, and since they're local, you can always take a pitchfork to their ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes that happens. In a worst case scenario, you know. Right? And there was <laughs> a there was a um, uh, company in China that was uh, manufacturing solar panels, and um, you know, and they had dumped some you know hydrofluoric acid, not hydrochloric, hydrofluoric, which is almost as bad into the river, you know, it's a byproduct. They should have cleaned it up and refined it to get more of the silica out of it, but they didn't. They got lazy and they wanted to pay for the equipment, so they just poured it out of the river. Well, so killed all the fish, obviously, and killed a hell of a lot of the pigs that were drinking the water out of there, and the farmers were using it to clean the pigs and all that, killed them. So the farmers, you know, not getting much uh, response from the government, they just straight up occupied the factory and said, all right, so either you guys aren't doing this anymore or we're staying. And it, I, yeah, I read a case about a copper mine that is, is a similar situation. They were mm -hmm. just dumping their stuff into uh, into neighboring mm -hmm. plots of land and stuff. Mm -hmm. And when the landowners found out, they sued them, and the 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 mine ended up paying restitution and stopped that practice. Yeah, and yeah. I think it, there's no reason to assume that that couldn't work in any case of I agree. pollution. Yeah. Now, I, one of the contentions I often hear, though, is, well, in a, in a society based on the non-aggression principle, you'll just have everybody suing everybody for, for the smog that comes out of your car or something, you know? And I think that's kind of ridiculous, because first of all, The, the level, I think the levels are important. If it's not affecting you, you're not going to sue somebody over that. I, I would think that there would be, so and, like there's a Better Business Bureau, there's right. a, there's there's consumer sure. advocacy groups. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that uh, there would certainly a market signal for it. There would be a need for it. So I would think that the company would come out and say, hey, you know what, based on the you know our standards, this is the gold standard for clean air, and you'd probably get... You know, multiple agencies saying, "Yeah, okay, that that's that's agreeable." And it's could be amended at any time or whatever as as, as new information comes in. But basically, uh, if someone's violating those emission standards, whether it be an auto body shop or a plant or mm -hmm. a micro manufacturing facility or you know a private person, whatever the case, and you can make that case, then then you've got something, right? You know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's oftentimes hard to, uh, like, talking talk about what you, going back to what you said earlier, this is kind of a hard situation, a hard topic for a lot of uh, libertarian anarchists because people who are sensitive to the environment oftentimes have, well, a real doom outlook with it, right? So right. Yeah. they want some immediate responses, right? And uh -huh. so here we are coming from a, non-policy perspective mm -hmm. there's no real easy sell for it you know what i mean and uh we're talking about uh in, you know responsible action basically at the individual level is is ultimately what we're talking about and it's a hard pill to to sell yeah but uh, yeah so let me ask this if you were trying to find rare earth minerals <coughs> on a meteorite, how would you go about doing it? Androids. 
Androids, yes. I mean, because I mean, you'd have to pay for people to be shipped out there, habitation, paying for food, all that sort of stuff. You'd probably be a little bit more efficient to to do use Androids for yeah. that sort of operation. And you'd Remember? probably send at least one guy on the trip to make sure everything's running. Right, slowly. right, right. And do you think that there could be? Because of the need for connection, but you don't want to send another human because possibility of a crash. Robot sex on this flight. I mean, <laughs> what, between the robots. Would it just be? Would scouting. it just be the one robot? Like, would it be oh, one? Oh, hold on, guys. Know? We're out of time. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, man. <laughs> Thirty minutes came you, right? up quick. I thought we had it this time. <laughs> I thought we could get that in there. <laughs> yeah, I thought we had time for that. Uh, we'll have to try another time. At have some a good point, night, guys. Robot Peace. sex.